World War II, Part II. While the Japanese and Germans could not launch direct assaults on U.S. territory, they did try to attack the U.S. mainland in novel ways. For instance, the Japanese used balloon bombs in attempts to kill U.S. civilians. Constructed mostly of paper and rubberized silk, the balloons carried both anti-personnel and incendiary bombs. The Japanese launched more than 9,000 balloons towards the U.S., though only about 1,000 made it. Less than 300 sightings were actually reported. The U.S. military and news media elected not to provide widespread coverage of the balloon, while the Japanese decided to end the offensive by April of 1945, certain that their operations had failed. However, in May of 1945, a balloon bomb killed six Oregon picnickers when it exploded as they dragged it from the woods. The federal government then publicized the balloon bombs, warning people not to tamper with them. The Oregon deaths were the only known civilian home front fatalities during World War II. Just as the terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001 showed the American cities were not safe from foreign attack, the attack on Pearl Harbor convinced many people that homeland security had to be maintained in addition to fighting in Europe and the Pacific. To ensure that American cities would remain safe, the Office of Def Civilian Defense, first headed by New York Mayor LaGuardia, had the responsibility of devising protective measures and elevating national morale. Soon, cities required citizens to practice blackout conditions and air raid wardens conducted drills as if German or Japanese aircraft were approaching to destroy houses and business. businesses. The civilian air patrol's duties included commissioning civilian pilots to patrol American coastlines and borders, facilitating search and rescue missions where needed. Officials established the Civilian Defense Corps to fight fires which may occur after a bombing raid, decontaminate areas followed chemical weapons attacks, and administer first aid. While the Axis powers never attacked the mainland, the prevalent thought at the time was an attack was pos not only possible, but likely. Off officials had dissolved the civilian defense agencies established during World War I at soon after that war. However, most of the World War II area ag era agencies remain in effect and to help civilian populations deal with Cold War concerns. Within the days of formally declaring war against the Axis powers, Congress packed the 1941 War Powers Act, which gave the president sweeping authority to conduct the war. As commander-in-chief, FDR would enter into and terminate contracts with defense industries. The act reconfigured government agencies to deal with war-related situations and emergencies and allowed for freezing foreign assets if needed. Most significantly, it gave the president the power to censor all incoming and outgoing messages. FDR appointed Byron Price, executive news director for the Associated Press, as director of censorship. Price relied mainly on media to regulate itself, which it had did fairly effectively. However, there were instances of fairly heavy-handed censorship. Magazines that sometimes included adult content were considered obscene, and Esquire magazine su successfully sued the Postal Service to allow for distribution in the mail. In another instance, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt received a letter of reprimand due to an entry in her May Day newspaper column in which she described the weather while on a trip with her husband. Mrs. Roosevelt promised never to do it again. Immediately after the attack on Pearl Harbor, more than 60,000 Americans volunteered for military service. The already undersupplied military now found itself overwhelmed. Rather than house enlistees in barracks, the Army put up in tents. The military also commonly had shortages of material. Many recruits trained with broomsticks instead of rifles, rocks instead of grenades, and trucks rather than armored vehicles. Not enough barracks were in existence. The typical enlistee first went to a reception center where doctors administered physical exams and vaccinated recruits against diseases such as smallpox, typhoid, and other that they may account overseas. In addition, doctors noted that the assessed recruits physical issues such as poor vision and dental problems. After the physical, the military issued recruits needed supplies for service, including uniforms, mess kits, and other equipment. Basic training for most recruits lasted eight weeks, in which instructors should subject, would subject them to physical training as well as classroom instruction in basic educate, military strategy and task, tactics. Recruits with higher levels of education were frequently placed in officer candidate school. While the Army segregated enlistees by race, they did not group them by region or social class. Mixed together, the troops frequently developed a brotherhood with recruits from different backgrounds and ways of life. The basic training and rec that recruits received placed an emphasis on physical training that would harden civilians into fighting men, building both strength and stamina. 
During this eight-week program, recruits constantly faced various tests designed to make sure that they could function in combat situations. Obstacle courses lined with barbed wire and lengthy force marches and speeded quick marches, usually while carrying heavy packs and extra field equipment. They practiced disassembling and cleaning their M1 rifle and their then resembling it under reassembling it under battlefield conditions. They learned how to fire their weapon quickly and accurately. Generally, trainees from rural areas had extensive hunting experience and therefore more success on the rifle range. Another aspect of basic training had instructors break down new recruits in order to rebuild them with a strong sense of discipline. A recruit caught smoking after hours might be forced to smoke a cigarette with a metal pail over his head, resulting usually in choking and vomiting. The recruit also mopped the floor who mopped the floor plurally might have to repeat the job with only a toothbrush. A soldier whose uniform didn't meet standards might result in extra calisthenics for the whole unit as a punishment. In the 1920s and into the 30s, the U.S. military had little strength compared to that of other industrialized world powers. When Hitler's forces invaded Poland in September 1939, the U.S. Army numbered only 190,000 men, many of whom had enlisted in the peacetime army to escape the hardships of the Great Depression. However, on the same day that World War II began in Europe, General George C. Marshall became Chief of Staff. Marshall asked FDR for an appropriation of six hundred hundred and fifty seven million dollars to help increase the size of the army as the military situation in Europe became bleaker for the Allies. The president agreed to most of the request. By the time France surrendered to Germany in May 1940, Congress had given the U.S. military nine billion dollars. Through the Selective Service Act of 1940, the size of the army grew dramatically. At its peak, the army numbered almost six million men, with the Air Force slightly more than two million. Although draftees made up most of the army, it could still defeat a well-trained enemy force while undergoing rapid expansion and training in wartime. With the millions of American men either enlisting in the armed forces or drafted, women, women had to take over many jobs, usually performed by men such as working in heavy industry, manufacturing tools of the war, including tanks, planes, and other material. The image of Rosie the Riveter became commonplace as women soon became the backbone of the industrial war during the war years. Other women sought a more active role in defense by joining specially created women's units in the armed forces. Many joined the wax, waves, spars, and other related units, filling in many non-combat positions, both stateside and overseas. Women also served as drivers, clerks, communications officers, pilots, and nurses. Thirty nurses were killed in action during World War II. However, while many women became the family breadwinner and proved that they could work as hard as their male counterparts, wartime employment had substantial drawbacks. The divorce rate increased substantially, as did juvenile delinquency among females. The incidence of alcoholism among women also grew. Many women had to uproot themselves and their families to relocate into communities that provided more defense industry opportunities. A new generation of latchkey kids frequently found without parental guidance or supervision, perhaps with their fathers in the militaries and mothers working a shift at a defense plant. U.S. military leaders saw in the early days of the war that the female population could provide significant military service as well. Impressed with the British Army's incorporation of women into military service, Army Chief of Staff George C. Marshall became a prominent proponent of women's units for the U.S. Army. With this backing and at the urging of other women leaders, including First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, Congress created the first Women's Auxiliary Army Corps, or WAC, in May of 1942. Congress upgraded the WAC to full military status within a year, renaming it the Women's Army Corps. WAC, as Corps women's members were informally known, contributed to the war effort by performing more than 200 non-combat jobs, including operating switchboards, driving staff cars, and sorting mail. The military stationed WACs at more than 400 mainland by bases as well as in both the European and Pacific theaters. By the end of the European War, the WACs had more than 100,000 members, including more than 6,000 commissioned officers. The Army named its director, Ovetta Culp Hobby, wife of former Texas government, Governor William Hobby, the head of the War Department's Women's Interest Section. After the war, she became the first secretary of the newly created Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, later the Department of Health and Human Services. With the WAC established by 1942, the Navy followed suit with similar programs called Women Accepted for Voluntary Emergency Service. My husband's grandmother served as a WAVE. Although an unofficial part of the Navy, the program's name indicated its temporary nature. 
after the war ended, members would be discharged. The Navy stationed waves, as individuals were called, only in the continental U.S. or in U.S. possessions such as Hawaii. They did not serve in any combat zones. Most waves worked as nurses in communications jobs and clerical positions and as storekeepers. The U.S. Coast Guard established a similar program called SPAR after the initials of the brand's motto, Semper Paradis, always ready. In 1948, Congress disbanded the waves by passing the Women's Armed Services Integration Act, which gave women permanent status in the armed forces. However, most female recruits were known as waves for much of the 20th century. Although the military barred women from participating in naval or ground combat operations, they still provided a valuable service to the U.S. armed forces in non-combat roles. Female aviators did the same through their service in the Women's Air Force Service Pilots Program. Two well-known pilots, Jacqueline Cochran and Nancy Harkness Love, independently proposed such a program prior to Pearl Harbor. While the Air Corps, Army Air Corps rejected these early submissions, the entry into the World, World War II changed the position of General Hap Arnold, as well as other military leaders. Women worked as civilian flight instructors, as well as ferried planes from factories to air airfields. Female pilots towed airborne targets for anti-aircraft drills, simulating strafing drills, and transported cargo. Perhaps the most importantly, the contributions of WASP made male pilots available to participate in combat. Unlike the WACs and WAVES, Congress failed to pass le legislation giving the WAVES WASPs equal military status with the all-male Army Air Corps. Considered civilian civil service employees, the WASP Corps was disbanded in late 1944. Only in the late 1970s did the U.S. government retroactively give WASPs equal military status, recognizing female pilots for their service. Although some women joined the military during the war, most found they could assist the war effort by working in the private sector. By the war's end, nearly 18 million women worked outside the home one and a half times the number that had performed similar labor in 1935. The shortage of male workers led employers to suggest women's work as homemakers had adequately prepared them for work in the industry. The majority of women working in defense plants earned much less than their male counterparts, though many used to working as homemakers without pay accepted lower salaries without question. Many women with responsibility of raising children as well as managing homes stayed housewives. However, they contributed to the war effort by growing victory gardens, which fed the family and freed food resources for troops consumption, and worked on recycling drives as well as buying war bonds. One of the most iconic images of the home front was that of Rosie the Riveter, a symbol of power of the working woman to help with the victory of World War II. Though the famous We Can Do It poster by artist J. Howard Miller is credited as one of the first uses of Rosie in wartime propaganda. Miller did not intend to associate this image with the character. Miller created the poster as a motivational tool for the Westinghouse Corporation, not the federal government. An actual factory employee, Rose Will Monroe, likely inspired the character of Rosie the Riveter. She worked as a riveter at Michigan's Willow Run Aircraft Factory. Several government posters encouraging women to work in defense plants featured her picture, and the government also sponsored a promotional film starring Monroe. Illustrated Norman Rockwell drew another famous conception of Rosie, this time as a welder, for the cover of the May 29, 1943 issue of the Saturday Evening Post. The original painting later sold at auction for nearly $5 million. Regardless of the character's origin, the rosy image helped spur women to help the war effort by taking on industrial jobs that had previously gone to men. As the government worked to mobilize the industry and manpower for the war effort, it also took steps to prepare the nation psychologically for a difficult struggle. This task fell in the Office of War Information, established in 1942. The OWI played several roles. One involved coordinating the release of war news via censorship and control of the media. In most instances, the OWI promoted media self-censorship of the media, which complied with many restrictions regarding troop movements, military campaigns, and so on. The OWI worked to promote patriotism through various means, including posters, propaganda films, and radio shows. Many feature some of the era's big celebrities. Similarly, the OWI helped to recruit women to work in the defense industry. The OWI also worked to educate foreign populations about American democracy through an international propaganda program, specifically with the Voice of America, a radio network that broadcast American news and music to various nations in Europe as well as other parts of the war. 
With the end of the war came the end of the need for OWI, and it dissolved in 1945.